good morning everyone and uh, good evening uh, chitra um it's such an honor to be in conversation with um, acclaimed author chitra banerji divakaruni i'm just going to take a moment to um, set the context of the book before we begin our conversation um so in the last chapter of the book the last queen um just as dilip singh immerses his mother's ashes in the sea he thinks about how uh, the people of punjab um revered his father as the lion of punjab maharaja ranjit singh and he thinks about how it's his mother who is truly the lioness of punjab and in her own way isn't she braver than than ranjit singh and chitra for me that was the most um, poignant moment in the book and thank you for writing this and for really allowing us to really traverse the journey of um, rani jindan often hailed as the last queen of punjab so for those who haven't read the book this part history part fiction account of my jindan story uh, is not only a celebration of the last queen of punjab um, a story little known heard or documented but also it raises a toast to a woman who is an epitome of courage conviction resilience endurance um, political astuteness uh, and also a woman who is unabashed in her desire for love a uh, power ambition and freedom what makes the book also interesting in classic divakarni style is that we hear the story through the voice of the queen um mai jindan herself a um, voice of a woman and this lends to the story um a voice of authority and authenticity uh, and i think it's also a reminder of the imperativeness of um, uh, listening to stories that are um, narrated through the voice of women through that are seen through the gaze of a woman for me the book was really a fascinating read i really couldn't put it down and i also wondered about how relevant the book is to the times that we live in um, where all of us so many women were still negotiating uh, problems of patriarchy the notion of agency and autonomy and so my jindans is a story that documents the life of a woman who really lived her life on her own terms uh, in an india that was still not independent Uh, negotiating a courtroom full of men but choosing always to listen to her own inner voice um so in a certain way for me divakarni's uh, my jindan is um a woman who wears her virtues and her flaws um with uh, grace um and a sense of the regal um so chitra i'm going to start off by asking you uh you know in the acknowledgments of the book you refer to ambassador navdeep sarna who gifted you his book the exile a novel based on the life of maharaja dilip singh and encouraged you in a certain way in your quest to write about maharaja's largely forgotten mother um i want to ask you what was that exact moment uh when you wanted to you know tell her story great question Well I want to start first of all by saying a big hello to the audience in Bangalore big good morning to all of you I wish I could be with everyone in person I have such great memories of being at the festival in previous years but we will do the best we can uh, given you know given all the uh, circumstances that we live in I uh, I love your question Akila because there was in fact a magical moment when uh, the idea for this book was sparked off in me and i did not know about rani jinda before this moment i knew about her husband maharaja dalip maharaja ranjit singh because he is so well known there are books and books and books and books about him and even his son maharaja dalip singh there are many books written about him because he's such a tragic figure but the wife the mother the queen maharani jinda very little is written about her and i certainly did not come across her until this moment when i went to a literary festival just like this one in kolkata and i had gone to release one of my earlier books uh, before we visit the goddess and i walked into the auditorium beautiful open air auditorium at, outside the victoria memorial and there was a, a screen on which slides were being shown and as i walked in 
the slide filled the screen and it was the image of this very regal woman with a face that was filled with life and with history and with just all the things that she had gone through and born courageously. And that became my inspiration. I said, who is this woman? I want to know more about her. And then that became also uh, the cover of the book. So uh, the talk was being given by William Dalrymple. He was talking about the Kohinoor. He had written a book on the Kohinoor along with Anita Anand. And uh, he was talking about how the Kohinoor had belonged to Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And then it passed on to Maharaja Dalip Singh and the British took it from him when he was just a child. Uh, when they also, at that time, they took the kingdom of Punjab away illegally from Maharani Jinda, imprisoned her, separated her from her son, and then soon after sent her son off to England. And then for many years, over a decade, mother and son would be separated until uh, in a very moving moment, which I show in this book, they will finally be reunited, uh, largely thanks to Maharaja Dalip Singh's uh, trickery. <laughs> but that's a great, wonderful story. But this answers your question. So I couldn't forget about this woman. I said, I must research her life. And why do I not know about her? She seems like a really regal character. Obviously, she was at an important moment of Indian history. She was in power and then lost that power. So I began to do research. And that is when I came across uh, Ambassador Navtej Sarnaji. He had come to Houston, where I live. And we met and uh, I had told, I told him at that point that I was thinking, I knew about his book and uh, I was thinking about writing about the mother of his hero. And he said, that is a great idea. And he echoed some of the things that were in my mind, which is she really deserves to have a book. She deserves to have more people know about her because, you know, it, what she did was very difficult. It was a great achievement for a woman in that era, in that time, in a hostile, very male-oriented court. Um, the things that she managed to do and the way she kept resisting the British until her, really her last breath is quite breathtaking. So he uh, gave me a lot of encouragement and based on that, and he gave me a copy of his book and based on that, then uh, I really started, I had already started doing some research, but then I really started looking at this as a serious project for myself. So I was getting all ready to go on, you know, go travel to some of these places, especially in Kolkata, there's a hotel, a historic hotel where the mother and son had been reunited after many years apart. And I was getting ready to do that and then COVID struck. So all my plans went out the window. But anyway, that gives you some of the answers to your question. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Chitra. But I'm also thinking about how did the fact that, um, you know, Dalip Singh um, insisted on a portrait of his mother being made by one of the British um, artists, did that in some sense allow you, um, you know, some glimpse, like is, is the face an index of a mind? I mean, did you refer to her picture often uh, to get a often. glimpse of Absolutely. Yeah. Often, yeah. often. And so, like I was telling you, you know, I started uh, writing this book and I was gathering material and then COVID struck. So I couldn't go to any places. So actually paintings and photographs, paintings like this one really became a big source for me. I spent a lot of time looking at these paintings, getting a sense of places and people. And I think looking at Maharani Jinda's uh, just her face, her visage, her expression gave me, it, it was like, it was like opening the door to her soul. I felt like I learned a lot about her character, just looking at this painting. And, you know, and then when I came to learn more about this painting, it is exactly as you said, her son commissions this painting, uh, painter Richmond, he paints this. Right. He's quite a famous painter at this point. And she doesn't want 
Uh, she doesn't want to be painted. She doesn't want a Britisher painting her picture. Uh, she realizes what the British had done, how they had tricked, uh, through trickery, taken away the kingdom of Punjab from her son, which, uh, you know, they were supposed to, it was a protectorate. They were supposed to protect the kingdom until he came of age, but you know, they just took it away. And she realizes all that, but out of love for her son, she sits for this portrait because he says, mom, when you are gone, I want this portrait with me always. I want it to be hanging in my living room wherever I live. And so, you know, I thought that gave me a real insight into her life, which is not only was she courageous and firm and a rebel, but she was a most loving mother. She did everything she could for the leap. And even at the end of her life, she does something very important for him. Um, maybe we won't give that away, but she really manages, you know, her greatest gift to him is at the end of her life. No, absolutely. I think it's also a reminder of how it's important to, uh, you know, archive, right? Archiving itself is such an important thing. So I'm glad that, you know, Dali put his foot down and insisted that uh, the British artist, um, you know, make a portrait of his mother. But um, I also want to ask you, uh, Chitra, next about, you know, we live in a world of, a cancel culture and women's voices more so are at the receiving end of this, you know, treatment. So do you believe that stories and books that resurrect these voices have the potential of documenting parts of history that have conveniently been left out? I do believe that. I think that is very true. I think it's very important. And it's certainly something that happened in the case of Maharani Jinda, because why is it that so much has been written about her uh, husband and her son and many other important women in Sikh history, but not her. And I think it is because the British created a terrible smear campaign around her. Uh, they sent out all of this false information about how she was lascivious. They called her the Messalina of the Punjab based on a very lascivious queen figure from the West. And uh, they just put, spread all these lies in her name, like as though she was sleeping with everyone in the court, all the courtiers, uh, which just was not true. Uh, she was a woman who lived on her own terms, but certainly nothing like the British showed her to be. So perhaps in response to that, she was kind of canceled out of you know, the history that we know. And it took me a lot of work to unearth that history. And I had to go it, to it sideways. I had to read many books about her husband and her son in order to find little passages about her, which then I put together. I was also lucky because I found some of her letters that she wrote at that time to various people. And also some letters that she wrote to Punjabi newspapers at that time, even from her prison where the British had imprisoned her, she was able to sneak out these letters through faithful retainers and they went to the papers and they were published. So her voice was certainly canceled. And unfortunately, Akila, as you have mentioned, this continues to happen um, even today when a woman maybe speaks out too strongly or through her character or through her career or whatever she stands up for. She's saying uncomfortable uncom truths. Often her voice will get canceled. And therefore, it's really important to resurrect these other older role models so that today we can look at them and we can feel inspired by them. Certainly when I was writing the story of uh, Rani Jinda, I was very inspired by her. I was very moved by her. Um, there were moments in the writing of this story when you know I had tears in my eyes because I was just feeling how amazing was this forgotten woman. Right. Um, actually, I'm going to ask you a question about you know you you talked about like um, you know I want to ask you really about your relationship with your characters, Chitra. You know, uh, do you? <laughs> get attached to them? I mean, do they consume you in a way that, uh, you know, you, it's how, how hard is it for you to stay objective and distanced 
um, from them because you spend so much time, you know, literally immersing in their lives. So how do you kind of, um, do you manage to keep, a, keep them at distance or do you sort of become consumed by them? We're just curious to know that. That's a great question. And I think both of those things happen. In the beginning, when I'm doing research and taking notes, I have to be very objective because I want to tell a true story, not just a story that I'm making up in my head. And this was even true when I was retelling the epics, like in Palace of Illusions, when I was retelling the story of the Mahabharata from Draupadi's angle or in Forest of Enchantments, retelling the story from Sita's, through Sita's eyes. Uh, and I want it to be true to the original story and also to the understanding of the character as I saw her objectively. So that's how I start with The Last Queen. I want to objectively find out what are the facts of Maharani Jinda's life? What did she actually do? Uh, and what has been written about her? And then having uh, received all of that information and then you know paintings, uh, maybe looking at pictures of Lahore Kila, where she spent so many important years of her life, uh, looking at all of those, then I start to live the character, right? Then I start to feel the character. Because in order to write, especially to write in first person, the character has to become alive for me. I have to almost inhabit the character, or you could say the character inhabits me. And then I get very close to the character. And now I've already gathered all the facts, so now I'm gathering the feeling, the feeling and the thinking of the character. So I think that's kind of my process. And then, you know, when she's going through like real hardships, I feel that too. Uh, there's a part in the book where the British will trick her and separate her from her son. They'll pretend that the regent will pretend, the British regent, that he's going to take Dalip Singh, who's just a little boy at that time, uh, to see the parrots in a garden. The parrots have come. So the little boy is so excited and Rani Jinda is quite happy to let him go. And she thinks it will be a good outing. So he leaves. Immediately, the soldiers come in and they transport her to a prison. They just force her into a carriage and transport her to a prison all by herself, not even her uh, very faithful maid, Mangla, is allowed to go with her. And she is just devastated. And when I was writing that scene, I mean, in order to write it, I really had to feel it. And as a mother, I, you know, I was just so devastated myself, thinking of how it must have been for her. Um, I can't write unless I make myself vulnerable to the character in this way. Absolutely. Um, Chitra, please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is your first um, historical fiction book, right? Uh, this is my first historical uh, novel for adult readers. I have an earlier one called Freedom Song, which was written for younger readers, though I hope <laughs> adult readers would enjoy it as well. And that focused on how children helped in our independence struggle how especially in the Bengal region, there were many children who got involved in the independent struggle because, you know, as children, they could access places that adults couldn't. And therefore they were very uh, helpful as spies and messengers. So that was Freedom Song. But this is my first novel for adults. And I had to get into a lot more research and really weigh the facts carefully because you know, I wanted it to be as accurate as possible. I wanted people to feel the emotion, but I wanted the facts to be right there as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to ask you a question about, you know, um, I work in the space of the classical performing arts. So um, often, you know, when you go for dance performances, especially Bharatanatyam, um, the role of the Sakhi, the friend, the confidante is often celebrated. It's sort of a recurring motive. And I noticed in your book, um, you know, uh, Mangala, Patani, uh, Mahi, Rani Gudan, um, these women really who come and go, some who stay with the Mai Jindan, you know, through the book, they really remind us of the power and strength of female friendships. Um, I want to ask you a, a little bit about how you, um, you know, really etched out these characters. Yes. 
A great question. So female friendships are important to me. And maybe some of it just comes out of my own life because I have been blessed with a lot of really good, close friendships with other women. And, you know, I, I feel that women understand each other's troubles and problems in a whole special way. And they can support us through our difficult times in a very special way as well. So this is true in uh, Rani Jinda's life uh, very much because, you know, as some people might know, she comes to Maharaja Ranjit Singh in a very unique manner. She is the daughter of the kennel keeper of the castle. So she comes from a very humble background. And when uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh falls in love with her and uh, she is the one who takes you know, quite an active role in that and says that uh, he, he's like, I'm too old, you're too young. She's like, no, I want to, <laughs> I want to be with you. Anyway, so she's very uh, forthright. But when she does get married and comes to the Killa, to Rah Lahore Killa to live, uh, there are enemies all around her. Like all the other queens hate her, especially one of the major queens, the major queen, the mother of the next king to be, uh, my Naken, she hates her. So she really needs some allies. And luckily there are a couple of allies that will enter her life at that time. Without whom, I don't know if she could have even survived because there were like death threats, you know, attempts on her life. So Rani Gooden and uh, Mangala, who is her maid servant, become really important in her life. And throughout, at very difficult moments, because Maharaja Ranjit Singh is going to pass away when uh, not only is Rani Jinda still a young woman, uh, Maharaja Dalip Singh has just been born. He's not even one year old. And she really needs some allies to help her through those times. So that's when all of these women become so important. And I think, you know, just looking at the history, I think they were all touched by her brilliance. There was something in her that was very attractive. There was something in her, something heroic that they all responded to. They saw the possibility in her. They saw the courage. Absolutely. So more power to girlfriends, um, Chitra. I really think that the book also raises a toast to that. Um, I think um, I have a little more time. So I'm going to ask you a really question about Mai Jindan's personality itself, which is really a culmination of so many, you know, characteristics. I love how she's someone who is very conscious of her actions and their outcomes. Uh, you know, she's truly a lady boss, to use a very modern expression. Um, a victim of her flaws, but also someone who exercises time and again agency and autonomy to, to do exactly what she pleases to do. You know, the way she, like, like you said, woos the Sarkar, uh, makes the first move on her lover, Lal, and finally leaves this world with three wishes on her deathbed for her son, Dalip. Um, agency, autonomy, freedom. Now, these are also crucial for women in the world that we live in. Uh, um, Chitra, so do, do, when you wrote the book, were you also thinking about these things, um, you know, and how relevant books like these are for the times that we live in? You're absolutely correct. I was thinking of those things. And similarly, you know, I, I thought those were very important in Palace of Illusions and Forest of Enchantments because heroines or the main characters in, in books and movies, you know, in all works of art, they do touch the lives of be people who are reading or seeing or listening. Uh, art has a great influence on us. So I really do feel that there's an opportunity for the main character of a novel to have a huge impact on readers, especially if it is a woman I think many young contemporary readers can learn a lot from her. And as you said, exactly, uh, Maharani Jinda, she lives her life on her own terms. Um, is she always perfect? No. And uh, why should she be? I <laughs> know human being is perfect. It's uh, kind of, I don't know, it's kind of unrealistic to expect women to be perfect. I think that's a great burden that's sometimes placed on women. I certainly didn't want to 
to place that burden on her. So she makes mistakes. She's hot headed. One of her faults, although it comes from a good place, is that she loves her brother, uh, Jawahar, very much. And he's the only family she has left, only birth family. So when he says, I want to come to Lahore, she knows that he's, he's going to be trouble, but she can't say no to him. When she falls in love with uh, Raja Lal Singh, you know, uh, she knows that it, it's unwise to proceed in that direction, but she says, I'm lonely. And it's not like I'm going to harm anyone. You know, I've been a widow for many years and she decides that she will pursue that love interest. So I wanted to show her, and, and even with the British where maybe someone, I don't know, wiser would have uh, tricked them and not gone headlong against them in a war. Um, she, she does that. She makes that decision which ends up being a very, a mistake. It, it ends up being a mistake that um, harms her, costs her a great deal. But I wanted to show all of those things because they're all a part of her. What I learned from Maharani Jinda's character, and I hope some of the readers will at least learn this, is that she never gave up. Even when there were circumstances outside were terrible. Like, you know, there's a part when she's imprisoned by the British. So first they imprison her in uh, and a prison that is in Punjab, but there's too much popular support for her. So they're afraid and they move her all the way near Benares and they put her in a different killer, very highly uh, guarded. And, but she doesn't give up. She's like, I'm gonna get out of here, even if I die in the process. And she manages to escape from that killer. Amazing, amazing woman. And then she's going to, you know, she's going to walk all the way across the uh, country to try and find sanctuary. I don't want to give away too much, but these moments, right? These challenging moments when she doesn't give up, but she says, I'm going to keep trying. It was very inspiring for me. I certainly hope it'll be very inspiring for readers who may be also facing, you know, challenges, problems, unfair things being done to them. And she's someone who said, doesn't matter what they do to me, they can't break my spirit. And isn't that inspiring? I was hugely inspired when I absolutely. came across this part of her character. No, absolutely. Also, I think um, um, she's so like unabashed in her desire for power, ambition, love, you know, and, and I, even today, unfortunately, these are all, uh, you know, that are things of the male preserve, right? Somehow we think that uh, it's okay for a man to, you know, sort of have these, uh, uh, be ambitious and all of that, but somehow a woman, you know, so I think it's, um, uh, she is a really inspirational figure. But Chitra, I'm just curious um, to know, you know, the way you introduce this book, I think you put out a picture of Mai Jindan on um, social media and asked people to guess. <laughs> Do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, well, you know, I love social media because it gives me a chance to connect with my readers. And that's pretty much how I always use social media to connect with readers in various ways. So, yeah. So, you know, I was like, who is this mystery woman going to be? She was in the, she was important in the battle against the British. She fought really hard and she was a great queen. And so, uh, people, like hundreds of people came up with guesses and only one or two said, could that have been her, right? So, you know, I, I thought it was a fun, like, game for us to play on social media because it made people look at who were the women who were important in our struggle for independence. And it made them realize at the end how so many of them had not heard about this amazing, wonderful uh, woman, complex, headstrong, all of those things, but also like quite, you know, quite a great romantic figure rising from a humble background to steal the heart of uh, the Lion of Punjab. So 
it was it was really I thought a great um, interaction, and it set the scene for the book. I think people were really waiting to see what they would learn about this magical woman. Right, um, Chitra. I also want to ask you a little bit about your writing process. Um, you know, you also work as an academic. You're you know you teach creative writing. So how do you uh, you know um, you know how do you sort of do you compartmentalize uh, you know the work you do as an academic and then your um, writing as a and as an author? How do you kind of separate the two, or they do they sort of segue into each other? How does it work? Well, uh, both of those things. So that's a great question because you know a lot of times writers ask me or or my students ask me, well, how do you find time? Because for all of us, time is an issue. But especially if you're a writer, time becomes a big issue because if you're going to do a good job of writing, you have to spend a lot of time on it. Part of it is the research. Part of it is the writing itself. Part of it is the rewriting and editing. And um, what I do is I just separate my days. So certain days of the week are for my writing and certain days I go into campus. And those are the days when I'll stay up late and prepare for class or grade papers. Now, I'm very blessed because I teach only creative writing. And that means I work only with writers. So what I'm teaching and what I'm writing, uh, they connect very nicely. So when we are discussing things about what makes a great plot, you know, that's something it's come out of my writing experience, but also it's something I can use back to remind myself of what makes a good story. So I feel blessed that in these two parts of my life are very closely intertwined, but I do have to set some days apart just for writing. So there'll be at least two to three days in the week when that's all I'm going to do. And I, you know, I've cut out a lot of things in my life. And of course, COVID has helped me cut out some other things like much less socializing. And, you know, I, I hardly watch TV. I get all my news from newspapers which I read online. So I've just um, managed to save time from other things, taken that and put it into my writing. And I always tell my students and to any writers in our audience today, you got to put the time into it. Now, part of my writing practice is that I also read a lot because I learn from other writers all the time. I know it's amazing, um, Chitra, that you actually, um, you know, um, didn't even make it to India, but you wrote this beautiful book that is so um, visually so rich and um, told through the voice of a woman. I'm just going to ask you one last question about what is the book you're working on next? Are you working on something already? Yes, I am. And I'm halfway through it. I'm very excited about it. And now, uh, having started writing the historical novel, I really wanted to write another one because I right. figured now I've kind of learned how to do it and I wanted to continue in that vein. And here, in the story of Maharani Jinda, we are early in the process of the colonization of India, right? And I wanted to pick up that story when that ends and when India becomes independent. So this historical novel is set when India becomes independent. It's set in the 1940s and it follows a family uh, in Bengal, a family of three sisters who are going to each be impacted very differently by uh, independence. So I'm very excited about the novel. And, you know, it's, it's in process. It'll take a little while because I want to do a good job, but I'm looking forward to sharing it with my readers. Thank you, Chitra. We're also looking forward to that. And thank you so much for, you know, telling these stories of women. Um, I'm just going to throw the floor open to any questions. If any of you would like to ask um, Chitra any questions. What part, what percentage of the book would you say is uh, fiction and what part is uh let's say, based on uh, historical evidence? Great question. Great question. So all the parts that deal with her public life, uh, they're all based on facts, like where she was at certain times, 
what happened to her? Like, when did she get married? How did she meet Maharaja Ranjit Singh? Uh, what happened when he dies and she has this little baby? How does she, how does Maharaja Dalip Singh come to the throne? Because there are several people who are in line before he is supposed to come to the throne. And how did they die? All of this. And what part does the very powerful Wazir Dhyan Singh, what part does he play? How did the British get involved? What happens in the Punjab wars, the Anglo-Sikh wars? Um, how is she imprisoned? How does she escape? How does she come to England? All of those things are historical. They're based on fact. Now, the private parts of her life, which nothing has been written about, is those are the parts I imagined. So what was her girlhood like when she was growing up? How did she feel when she met Maharaja Ranjit Singh? How did she feel when she came to Lahore Kila as a young bride and faced all of this antagonism? How did she feel when she was stuck in the prison away from her son? And then she hears from somebody that now he's been sent to England and she feels that she'll never see him again. So all of how did she feel when after many, many years, he manages to come back to India and to see her? So those things, there's no historical evidence of what she was feeling, what she was thinking, what she might have said at those moments. But those are the things that bring a character alive, right? So those are the things that I imagined. But all of the events are all fact-based. So that's kind of the weaving of fact and imagination that I uh, went through in order to write this novel. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And just uh, one other thing, like uh, I lent this book uh, to my mom after I read it and uh, she has become a big uh, fan of uh, Rani Jindan's family, I would say. So she went on to read uh, biographies of uh, Duleep Singh, Ranjit Singh, and also recently she's been reading uh, her granddaughter, Sophie, I, I believe, like uh, who works yes. only for the Indian movement and also for the women's right uh, in the UK, right? So Yes, thanks, yes. Thanks to you. That's so that. lovely. Uh, I only wish And that makes me so happy that you shared the book with your mother, because that's, you know, that's one of the things that I hope for, that people will write uh, they, that people will read and share with other people in their family. And then also we will have uh, intergenerational conversations about the novel and also conversations between men and women about the novel because, you know, gender role uh, roles are so important in this novel. So thank you very much for doing this. Hi, Chitra. I've been a big uh, fan of your work from right from the beginning, 1997, I think. Mistress of Spices, and uh, I have read your books as they got have got released. And the way I look at it, there was that early part, uh, which was more like a Indian immigrant into America, and then you know there were lots of books on that. Then there was I I mean I felt there was um, Palace of Illusions and Enchanted Forest, which was in one mode. Uh, so I and now of course you seem to have come into the historical fiction genre. So I was wondering, how is it, you know, been writing for 25 years or something? How is it? How has the journey been? And how have you kind of evolved as a writer and selected new subjects and genres? Yeah, great question. And, and you're right. So in the beginning, I was very interested in the immigration experience, because I as an immigrant had moved to the US and really moving to the US made me into a writer because it put me in uh, a place that I was unfamiliar with. It really made me think about India much more than when I was living in India because you know, at that point I'd been surrounded by Indian culture and never thought that much about it. But only after I quote unquote was moved away from it, lost it, then it became valuable to me. So that was a whole early part and then you know, for a long time, I've been thinking about our epic heroines because I had learned uh, about them when I was a child from stories my grandfather used to tell me. But as I thought more and more about them as an adult, as a woman, 
it struck me that, you know, these amazing women characters have always kind of been pushed to the edges of the story. And we don't really know how they felt, how they thought about what was happening in their lives. And so I wrote the story of Draupadi uh, in Palace of Illusions and then Sita in Forest of Enchantments because these two women fascinated me. And I felt that they were so contemporary, their struggles and their, you know, their trials and their triumphs they were all very contemporary and we could all learn from them. And uh, then as you were hearing, I mean, I think Maharani Jinda kind of chose me. She appeared in my life. I wasn't thinking of writing a historical novel. I wasn't certainly thinking of writing about her because I didn't know anything about her. So I think I was just given this story. Uh, the universe or Maharani Jinda just gave me this story. And so now I'm continuing in the historical vein because I also understood something as I was researching this novel. You know, there's a great saying uh, by a quote from George Santayana. And he says that something to this, uh, I don't, I might not have the exact words. He says, those who do not care to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. You know, so, and this is true. If we don't learn from what has happened in the past, if we don't understand what the problems were and also what should be admired, then we're just going to repeat the same mistakes, suffer the same things. And so we've been talking all this time about Maharani Jinda, but there's another big lesson in The Last Queen where you see how the British take over kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. So that this, really this small group of Britishers, how is it that they're able to take over these huge kingdoms, these powerful kingdoms? Uh, they infiltrate it and they cause infighting and they appeal to the greed of certain noblemen in each place. But because this other kingdom doesn't learn the lesson of the previous kingdom that was taken over, it falls the same way. And so I think Maharani Jinda's story, and she's gonna say something at a certain point, is that if we don't come together as a country, as a culture, as a society, we are going to fall apart. And I think that is something really in many countries of the world, and certainly in India and in the US, we are seeing divisiveness destroys. And I think that's a great lesson of history. So I'm very interested right now in historical lessons like that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I just, uh, just curious, and it's a bit like asking which of your children is your favorite, but which of these, which of these phases, I'm not necessarily asking for a single novel, but which of these phases were, of your writing were, were you most fond of? Well, I have to say uh, that of all the things that I write, I mean, I love them all and I've learned from them all, but writing about the epics, I think was at once the most challenging and the most satisfying and the most scary. I was like, oh, I've prayed a lot. I'm like, God, don't let me mess it up. Please help me write the story of Draupadi and especially the story of Sita because she is so important in our culture. So, you know, in God's hands. Thank you, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chitra. It has been um, wonderful um, speaking with you. Um, thank you for answering all our questions with so much um, grace and patience and allowing us so many more insights, not just into your writing, but also your characters. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone who watched the session. And have a good thank day. Thank you. Everyone. Yes, thank you to everybody over there. Have a great day. Read lots of books. Enjoy the festival. And thanks to the Bangalore Festival for inviting me. And thanks to Akila for wonderful questions. <laughs>